It being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. The national accounts released today show that the Australian economy contracted by 1.9 per cent in the September quarter. Can the minister confirm that growth in the September quarter is the worst out of the 28 OECD countries that have reported so far? The minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Mr. President, I thank you for. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Gallagher for the question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I can confirm the release of the national accounts today. Uh, and that the release of the national accounts show a contraction of 1.9 per cent through the September quarter. Uh, this is uh, the result and the price of, uh, of lockdowns. Uh, it is um, not an un unanticipated result, uh, although it is in fact ahead of market expectations in terms of what the result was likely to be. Uh, I don't, Mr. President, have, uh, have the uh, precise tally uh, for the quarterly figures across OECD countries that, uh, that the Senator uh, asked for, but uh, it is certainly the case, Mr. President, uh, that uh, Australia's recovery and economic performance through the pandemic uh, is in the top three across advanced economies around the world, and that our performance in recovery uh, through year growth uh, stronger than Germany, Canada, Italy, Japan, the United Kingdom, many others. Mr President, uh, through the course of this year there have been many disruptions. Uh, since the Delta variant became the dominant variant of COVID-19, uh, there have been lockdowns or state of emergency declarations in at least 81 different countries. Uh, that has obviously had significant impacts right around the world. Uh, but in Australia, uh, growth remains up 3.9 per cent throughout the year. Order. Growth remains up 3.9 per cent throughout the year. Uh, and Mr President is driven uh, by strong performances in a number of sectors. Uh, our rural exports in particular driving strongly, increasing by 47 per cent throughout the year. Uh, the terms of trade and trade surplus for Australia are now their highest on record. This is a demonstration, Mr President, of, uh, of just one area of the policies that our governments have pursued to create uh, the maximum range of opportunities for Australian businesses and exporters delivering Order. for them and delivering for the nation as well. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr President. In the September quarter, America's economy grew by 0.5 per cent, the UK by 1.3, Canada by 1.3, Germany by 1.7 and France by 3 per cent. But the Australian economy contracted by 1.9 per cent. If the Morrison government was doing such a great job managing the economy, why is our September downturn the worst in the OECD so far and the third biggest downturn in the history of the national accounts? Order. Order. Order on my right and my left. Order. Senator Hughes, order. Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. Senator President, if you have to ask what the cause of the economic impact in the September quarter was, then clearly you don't understand much about how the economy operates, because the cause was very clearly the lockdowns that occurred across the country. Order. That's evident from the fact that Order. the dominant factor, the dominant factor Order. in relation to the downturn, was the decline in household consumption. Unsurprisingly, household consumption declines uh, when people uh, are living under Order lockdown restrictions. But we know, Mr. President, the rebound is strong. We know that because the ABS payroll jobs data shows 350,000 jobs coming back from September already. 350,000 jobs in that short period of time coming back. We know that Australia's global performance, as I said before, is on the through year from the depths of the pandemic in the top three in the world. So those opposite can seek to select a narrow band of time. We've got Minister, the demonstration the evidence Minister, of Australian jobs Minister, and Australian strength. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Gallagher, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that if Mr Morrison had done his two jobs on vaccine and quarantine, the Australian economy and Australia would be in a much better position than it is in now. Order. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Order on my right. Minister. So, so Mr. President, the Labor Party don't understand that the cause of economic distress 
come, that comes from lockdowns, and the Labor Party seem to think the Prime Minister of Australia only has two jobs to do. Well, Mr. President, they're wrong on all counts. They're wrong on all counts. Oh, now, no. what is helping to fuel that recovery, the 350,000 jobs that have come back oh, just no. in the space of a month or so, is the policy are the policies that our government has implemented. Our economic recovery plan fuelled by the oh, fact no. that Australians have got more money in their pockets from tax cuts that we have delivered, $1.5 billion a month on average of support going through, fuelled by the policies outlined in the budget in terms of encouraging Australian businesses to invest more, particularly across plant, machinery, equipment, which we have seen such strong growth of, which is going to make sure Mr. President, that we do not just have the growth now but we have more productive and competitive businesses to fuel the export boom that we're seeing from Minister, Australia and growth across Minister, so many other sectors. Your time has expired. Senator Abetz. My question is to the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on the risks to Australia's vital maritime supply chains and our economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic in the lead-up to Christmas? The Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Abetz for the question. Uh, Mr. President, as we all know, Australia is an island nation. Uh, we are bordered by three of the world's oceans. What that Order. means for Australians is ports are the gateway to our open trading economy. Anything that is done to interfere with our ports and slow productivity has a direct impact on Australians. Exports, in fact, make up around a quarter of Australia's gross domestic product. It also, as we know, the port, they employ hundreds of thousands of Australians right across our great country. And as we also know, Australians themselves rely on many imported goods in their everyday lives. And in the lead up to Christmas in particular, when people are out there, they are spending money and businesses are looking to get access to the products that they need, we need to ensure our ports operate both smoothly and efficiently. But, Mr President, what we do know is that there is an ongoing threat of further industrial action at our ports prior to Christmas. And this certainly, for all of those businesses out there who rely on getting their product into the country, this is of great worry to them. The Morrison government does, of course, continue to be briefed regularly on this threat and supply chain pressures. The National Coordination Mechanism is meeting weekly with industry players in the lead up to Christmas. And the one thing that we continue to say to the parties involved uh, in this dispute is negotiate in good faith and please resolve your issues. But at the same time, the government's position is very, very clear. The Morrison government stands ready to take action if needed to protect the Australian economy from serious harm. Mr President, we will stand up for all of those businesses out there, for all of those Australians out there, and make sure that at this time of the year they have Minister, access to the goods they need. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question. With Australia being a trading nation, how important is it for Australians and Australian businesses to have both a working and productive waterfront? Before I call the minister, there is a lot of discussion happening on my left. All interjections are disorderly. Senator Wong, you are not helping. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And as we all know, inefficient ports end up being a tax on all of us. They end up costing Australians money. They can end up costing businesses jobs. Uh, that is not good for any of us. And that is why the Morrison-Joyce government have taken action to improve the productivity of our ports through infrastructure projects, but also through removing regulatory roadblocks for trade. We've introduced the simplified trade system which has been streamlining compliance costs for Australian importers and exporters whilst upgrading our legacy ICT systems. Whilst this is working, we know that productivity at our ports remains a challenge. This has been going on for a very, very long time, and in particular in impacting Australia's maritime supply chains. So what the Treasurer will do is release terms of reference for a Productivity Commission inquiry into the efficiency of our maritime logistics system. We need to ensure that the productivity on our ports is as best Minister. as it can be. 
Senator Betts, a second I thank the Minister for the good news about the Productivity Commission inquiry and ask further what risks is the Minister aware of to a productive and efficient shipping industry, particularly to our Order. mum and dad family businesses? Minister. Order. Senator Ayres. Minister. Well, thank you, and I'll take that interjection from Senator Ayres, because Senator Ayres is actually not the New South Wales government. Um, it is a potential Albanese Senator government. Ayres. That is actually the risk. Uh, to port productivity in Australia. Because, Mr President, what you have is a potential Albanese government that is beholden to the unions, a government that is beholden to the MUA. Now, if you are beholden to the MUA, what that means is if you do need to step up and take action to ensure that Senator Australian McAllister. families they can get access Senator to the goods and McAllister. services they need, Australian businesses they can get access to the product they need, you won't be able to say no. And that is not a good thing, Mr President. That is not a good thing, because when you have an inefficient port system, when you have action being taken that quite literally closes things down, you need a government that is strong. You need a government that understands productivity on our ports is essential to ensuring that, in particular, our economic recovery from COVID-19 continues. Senator Ayres, don't interject My during your own question. You have the call. <laughs> Crikey. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Mackenzie. The Minerals Council of Australia has admitted that mine workers employed as casuals by labour hire companies are paid, on average, 24 per cent less than permanent employees of the, of the mine operator. Does the Deputy Prime Minister support labour hire being used to undermine the pay of mine workers in regional Australia? The Minister, the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And on behalf of the Deputy Prime Minister, what we do support is an ongoing uh, investment in a sustainable and responsible and economically viable uh, minerals industry so that workers in the resources industry right across uh, not just central Queensland but your own home state of New South Wales can have sustainable, rewarding careers in an industry that not just underpins local economies in regional Australia Minister. but indeed— Minister. Senator. But it's very clear, relevance, it's very clear that she is not going to remotely go close uh, to answering the question, which was, if I can remind you, about whether the Deputy Prime Minister supports labour hire being used to undermine the pay of mine workers in regional Australia. Senator Ayres, I, I, I think we do need to acknowledge that the Minister had only just started her answer. Uh, you've brought her back. To your question, Minister, you have the call. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I didn't forget your question. I was just reiterating the National Party and the Liberal Party's commitment to a sustainable uh, resources sector to ensure that these workers are absolutely being employed. And I'm just wondering, uh, post next election, when, if you're planning to be in alliance and coalition with the Greens, whether you will actually hold the same. Uh, views and whether the workers that you seek to purport that you represent and stand up for in this place uh, will actually be looking to you and saying, why didn't you stand up for us? Why didn't you back a coal industry? Why didn't you back a gas industry? These guys want to shut everything down. Uh, so whether we absolutely, if it has the word fossil Minister, in it. Minister, Minister, on a point of order. Make the point of order. To Are you rising on a point of order, Senator Ayers? I am. I am. I am, President. I know that the minister wants to stick to the partisan talking Minute, points. What is the point? But of the order? point of order is relevant. She is not. She is not in the same galaxy as the question is. Senator Ayers, Minister, I will bring you back to the question. It was a reasonably narrowly framed question. I believe you were going to the question, but I will bring you back to the question. 
Minister, you have the call. You have 38 seconds remaining. Thank you. Well, the government believes in a workplace relations system that promotes fair, safe, harmonious and productive workplaces. That encourages employers and employees to work together, not a system that pits them against each other. When it comes to labour hire specifically, which is a proportion of all employees, uh, has been stable at less than 2 per cent of the last decade. Of the nearly 13 million employed Australians, less than 115,000 were employees paid by a labour hire firm. That is only 1.1 per cent of all employees. The record high of 1.5 per cent was recorded under a previous Labor Minister, government in both 2008. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Deputy Prime Minister Joyce refused to answer a question about the impact of same job, same pay in regional Australia last week, handballing it to Minister Fletcher, who claimed, and I quote, this so-called same job, same pay issue is essentially a made-up issue. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with Mr Fletcher that same job, same pay is a made-up issue? Minister. Order. Well, I, I assume that Senator Ayres is actually referring to um, his bill. Um, and what I'm actually wanting to put on the table is what the government's view is around labour hire companies. My advice is that almost all labour hire companies actually use enterprise agreements that are signed off uh, and by the CFMEU. We support, uh, as a government, an industrial relations system. Uh, the government doesn't actually set the wages. That's a negotiated outcome uh, between workers. Uh, yeah, let's remember who actually set up the fair work that we're operating uh, system that, that we're operating under. Minister, uh, Minister, sorry, Minister. Please resume your seat. Senator Wong on uh, a point uh, of order. Uh, yes, I, I wondered if uh, direct relevance. We are actually putting a direct quote to the minister and asking uh, if the Deputy Prime Minister agrees with Mr Fletcher that same job, same pay is a, quote, made-up issue, end quote. I've allowed you to restate the question to the minister. Uh, minister, you have the call. Well, what I'm going to in answering the question is actually that our government supports an industrial relations system which relates to jobs, which relates to wages, who gets paid for what, when and where. And I've been directly Order. relevant to the question uh, in both my first answer and in my second. In terms of helping our, our nation recover from COVID-19. Time. Sorry, Minister. Please resume your seat. Time. Senator Ayres, second supplementary question. BHP, the largest miner in Australia, told the Senate Job Security Committee that more than half of its workers at mine sites nationwide are employed by labour hire or other contractors. Does the Deputy Prime Minister believe that two mine workers in regional Australia doing exactly the same job should get the same pay? Minister. Well, I am sure that the Deputy Prime Minister wants businesses in this country to operate under, uh, legally and, and under the law. We want to make sure that we have rewarding, sustainable careers, not just in the mining industry, Senator Ayres, but right across the economy in regional Australia, and for people, local workers, to be paid correctly and fairly for the work that they do. Um, and that is why, under your fair work system, we've done the changes that we have been able to get through um, in this particular period of government. But we want to make sure that employees are protected, that they are having rewarding Minister, careers. Please resume your seat. Senator Ayres, on a point of order. Not, not remotely relevant. Each of these questions constructed, as you, as you indicated early, quite narrowly. The question was, does the Deputy Prime Minister believe that two mine workers working side by side doing the same job should get the same pay? And she hasn't come close Senator to Ayers. beginning Senator answering Ayers. that question. Senator Ayres, you have, you have restated a part of the question. Senator Mackenzie, I believe, was being relevant to the question. Uh, I will return to Senator McKenzie. 
Well, in my previous answer, as I uh, stated, the um, enterprise agreements negotiated in the coal mining industry are signed Order. off by the CFMEU. And so, if you have an issue with how people are actually being paid in that area, maybe you go, need to go see your mates. Your private members bill is actually discouraging employment <coughs> right Sen across Minister, Australia. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Attorney General. There has been extensive criticism of the government's Integrity Commission model, judged to be the weakest in Australia. We've been told repeatedly that the department and the attorney have been considering feedback received during multiple rounds of consultation. At estimates in March this year, both the department and Assistant Minister Stoker said of the draft exposure bill, quote, we've identified some ways in which it could be improved. We're quite sincere in our desire to reflect that feedback in the next version, end quote. Yet the Prime Minister and several other ministers have this week said that the government's proposal remains unchanged from the exposure draft. Why hasn't feedback been taken into account? Was it always just sham consultation to allow you to delay tabling your bill? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. And uh, Senator Waters, no. Uh, the consultation was general Ryan consultation, and certainly the issue we have is this. We have a bill to deliver a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. That is a bill that we have. It is a bill that has been out there. Not only do we have a bill, Mr President, Senator Waters, we have actually committed funding to actually fund the body when it gets up, $150 million. We have consulted widely on its structure. And what our proposed model will do will build on the already strong anti-corruption arrangements that exist at the Commonwealth level. We have released our bill to the public. And in fact, if you were to join us, we could forget about the Labor Party because they just want a political witch hunt. They just want a political witch hunt when it comes to a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. They are not interested, Senator Waters, in a model that ensures that integrity is pursued in a manner Minister, which— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Waters, on a point of order? Yes, a point of order on relevance. My question went to whether or not feedback from the consultation has been reflected in the draft or not. Nobody wants to hear a lecture Senator about the order. politics. Senator Waters, I was listening to the minister. Uh, I, there was also a long preamble, and as you know, direct relevance is judged on the whole question, not merely the last part of a question. Uh, Attorney General, you have the call. Thank you. Well, as I was saying, but you see, Senator Waters, unfortunately from that comment, I'm going to assume that you also do not want to support the Commonwealth Government's Commonwealth Integrity Commission. The fact of the matter is we have a model. The bill is out there. We have funded the model, Senator Waters. We have released our bill to implement it. But this should be something that is not just bipartisan. It should be a multi-partisan approach to putting in place a model, Mr President, that ensures that integrity is pursued in a manner which respects due process, due process and democracy. And clearly from your comments, Senator Waters, you are also not interested in doing that. If you are interested in a political witch hunt, nothing more and nothing less, then that is not something we are going to agree on. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yes, thanks, President. At the National Press Club today, Geoffrey Watson QC <laughs> said that public hearings, where the ICAC has determined that they're in the public interest, Order. Are, are you going to make some more interjections? <laughs> I dare you. Order. Or can I ask my question? Order. Order. Yes, this is question time. I do Order. get to ask you questions. That this is, is how this works. This is not a time for discussion across the. Senator Waters, resume your seat. Order on my right. The questioner and the person answering the question should both be heard in silence. Senator Waters, uh, please continue your question. Thank you, President. So, as I was saying, Geoffrey Watson QC said that public hearings, where the ICAC has determined that they're in the public interest, are essential to deter maladministration, expose corruption, earn public trust, and allow ICAC findings and processes to be interrogated. And yet, members of this government have described it as a witch hunt, as kangaroo court and the Spanish Inquisition, 
Senator Why does the government continue to demonise transparency and continue the protection racket you've been running for years? Senator Waters, I allowed you to continue there as you were interrupted during your questioning, but I believe, to be honest, that question would have gone over time regardless. So I will give the Attorney General the call. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. President. I'm glad you actually allowed Senator Waters to run over time because I didn't hear everything she said, but I did catch the words Spanish Inquisition. And you see, Senator Waters, that is exactly what we are not going to pursue a Spanish Inquisition. Because at the end of the day, this needs to be a body, a body which ensures integrity is pursued in a manner which respects both due process. Mr President, and democracy. Senator Waters seems to forget, and the Labor Party do seem to forget as well. The Commonwealth Integrity Commission is to investigate corruption, serious corruption. It is not a tool that is to be used to wear vexatious and politically motivated claims. You want a Spanish Inquisition. That is not something that we are going to support. Senator Waters, a second supplementary. Thank you, President. At the Press Club today, former chair of the Law Council of Australia and now counsel of the uh, Civil Liberties, Pauline Wright, said that the threshold set by the government's model would prevent most matters from even being investigated, and she described that as unconscionable. Why is the government proposing an integrity commission that would not be able to investigate most breaches of integrity? The Attorney General. Well, I completely disagree uh, with what Senator Waters has just quoted. Mr President, the government's model that we have put forward builds on the already strong anti-corruption arrangements that already exist at the Commonwealth level. The Senator body that Waters. we put forward would be a specialised investigation body for the most serious forms of corruption with the resources and powers necessary to fulfil that role. At the same time, and for some reason the Australian Greens don't seem to agree with this, the body Senator will have Lyons. appropriate safeguards to protect Senator Waters, the rights and reputations of the people in, it investigates, but also robust oversight through an independent inspector general and a dedicated parliamentary committee. The telling words, Senator Waters, from everything that you have said is Spanish Inquisition. Spanish Inquisition. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Will the Minister update the Senate on the steps the Liberal and Nationals government has taken this year in relation to supporting Australian women and focusing on their safety? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes for her question. Yesterday's report on Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner has underscored the task that is ahead of us, both here and nationally, a task to which we as a government are very strongly committed. Too many Australians, particularly women, do continue to face harassment, violence and inequality across the country. However, we have made progress in important areas. Addressing inequality is fundamental, and that is why the Morrison government is supporting women's leadership and strengthening women's options by helping to enhance economic security. We have established a cabinet task force dedicated to women's safety and economic security, including ministers with specific responsibility in those areas. And I acknowledge Senator Rustin, Senator Hume and Senator Stoker and their roles. Our women's budget statement is investing a record $1.1 billion in women's safety. Our measures include the Escaping Violence Payment, the Safe Places Program, with 780 additional emergency accommodation places for women and children, the Stop It at the Start campaign about creating more respectful attitudes. We have funded or fully implemented most of the recommendations of the Respect at Work report, with further work underway. And we are finalising the next national plan to end violence against women and their children following a valuable and important national summit. We've also funded national partnerships with states and territories for frontline services during COVID-19. 
Just as within parliament we must work across parties in addressing these issues, nationally we must work between governments, with the private sector, community and advocacy groups and frontline organisations. Mr President, this is a task for all Australians. Senator Hughes, a Thank you, Mr. supplementary President. question. Can the minister outline the government's investments in women's economic security and workforce participation? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Through a $1.9 billion investment in the women's budget statement of May of this year and our broader policies, the Morrison government is working to build women's economic security and to grow women's workforce participation. We've increased the childcare subsidy to make childcare more affordable. Our Boosting Female Founders program has awarded nearly $12 million to 51 women-owned and led startups. Our Career Revive program is supporting 60 additional employers to attract or retain women after they take a career break, and the Family Home Guarantee is supporting single parents to buy a home. We know the COVID pandemic has had a particular impact on women's employment, but our economic recovery plan has helped create jobs, rebuild our economy and provide the conditions to enhance women's economic security. We will continue to focus on these tasks as we build the recovery. Senator Hughes, a Thank second you, supplementary President. question. Can the minister also outline to the Senate the government's support for women's leadership and equality? Minister. Mr President, this government is strongly committed to supporting more women into leadership positions. We've expanded the successful Women's Leadership and Development Program and funded over 70 projects across Australia in both urban and regional areas that support around 50,000 women and girls into employment and leadership opportunities. Our Academy for Enterprising Girls, for example, is developing young women's skills in entrepreneurship, now supporting over 6,300 students. We're also leading by example. We are less than half a percent away from our goal of having 50 per cent of women holding government board positions. We set that target and we will meet it. Under the Morrison government, the gender pay gap has narrowed to its lowest level on record at 13.4 per cent, but I acknowledge and recognise that the impact of COVID-19 and consecutive lockdowns has impacted that figure. Continuing to narrow the gap and enhance women's leadership and equality remain our priorities. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Senator Fairavanti Wells has described the draft Commonwealth Integrity Commission model put up by the Morrison-Joyce government as, and I quote, the weakest and least effective integrity agency in the country. Wow. Is Senator Fairavanti Wells right? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Urquhart for her question. Um, the uh, the answer to her question, in short, is no. Um, uh, now, Mr. President, uh, the model that uh, that Senator Cash indeed was speaking about in the chamber uh, just before uh, is a model that has uh, has been carefully developed uh, to ensure that it focuses where an integrity commission should focus in terms of the elimination of corruption, in terms of tackling yes. corruption in public office. Uh, and in terms of ensuring, ensuring, Mr. President, uh, that officials, public officials, office holders uh, are held to account, uh, and that you do prevent effectively that. It builds upon what is uh, a very strong existing framework uh, in the Commonwealth government. Uh, we should never underplay the important role that our existing integrity agencies, police agencies, and others play in relation to ensuring uh, that the law is upheld in Australia uh, and that we do have uh, one, of, uh, one of the best systems yep. arguably in the world in terms of the transparency, the accountability and the legal arrangements that apply uh, in our country to Order. ensure, uh, to ensure uh, that in this country uh, everyone is held to account and everyone operates within the law. But the government recognises uh, the opportunity uh, to be able to enhance that framework, and that's the work that Senator Cash and her predecessor have done in developing this model, developing a model uh, that is underpinned by hundreds of pages of legislation. I remind through you, Mr President, Senator Urquhart Order and her colleagues uh, that the Labor Party's Integrity Commission uh, is a two-page glossy brochure at present. So, Senator Cash, hundreds of pages of legislation yes. Yes. Uh, that, if the Labor Party were yes. willing to back it, could be passed through this parliament. Absolutely. Senator Urquhart, you and your team, 
two pages, nice glossy brochure. Congratulations to those who did the design work, uh, but of course it's not actually an integrity commission model at all. Senator Rickert, a supplementary question. Senator Fear of Andy Wells has also said, and I quote, negative public perceptions are compounded when politicians dig their heels in, spin the story and fail to take responsibility for their actions. Is Senator Fair of Anti Wells referring to Mr. Morrison? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Senator Fear of Anti Wells is, uh, is as entitled as any of the other 75 senators elected to this place uh, to come into this chamber uh, to provide speeches, to give general reflections in relation to uh, the way in which the way in which uh, politics operates. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. President. I recognise the enormous contribution that Senator Ferrier of Anti Wells makes on behalf of New South Wales uh, to, uh, to our party and to our government in particular, and has done so through a wide range of different roles, uh, Mr. President. Uh, but, Mr. President, uh, I know as well that the model for an integrity commission we have developed uh, is a sound model, a model that strikes the balance of ensuring that we would have an integrity commission focused on rooting out corruption, on prosecuting where applicable, but not, Mr President, on show trials. And I know those opposite just want show trials. They just want politics. We actually want effective reform. Minister. Sen order. <laughs> Senator McAllister. <laughs> Senator Urquhart, second supplementary question. Senator Fear of Anti Wells has asked, and I quote, those who resist the introduction of, of an effective federal integrity body raise people's curiosity. One has to ask the question, are they conflicted? Why are they resisting the implementation of such a body? What is Mr Morrison trying to hide from the last eight years? Minister. Thanks, uh, thank, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, we're a government Order. that proudly turns up answers questions, even sometimes quite silly ones, works our way through all the different processes uh, and, indeed, Senator in having Keneally. said that we would develop Senator an integrity commission, we spelled out the type of integrity commission that we would develop. We've gone Senator through the process Ayers. of developing that into legislation. We have the legislation there. We've budgeted $150 million uh, to ensure to support it and to provide for it. And Mi the only barrier, Mr President, the Minister. only barrier to it Minister. actually Passing Minister. into law are those Minister. opposite who say those opposite. Minister, resume your seat to, until there is silence in the chamber. Qu P Senator Wong, it's an answer to one of your questions, Senator Wong. You possibly should be listening to the answer. Interjections are always disorderly. I cannot hear the minister, and he's standing only a few metres from me. Minister, you have the call. Now, now Mr. President, their, their two-page glossy was developed by the member for Isaacs, the shadow attorney general. But of course, we know his track record, which shows what the Labor Party really want. He sought on nine different occasions uh, to refer matters to the Australian Federal Police, and they've all been tossed out because it's all just about frivolous politics, all about show trials, all about smearing and allegations by those opposite. Minister. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts, Senator Hume. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is committed to keeping Australian women and all Australians safe online? The Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Chandler for her question. Mr President, the Morrison government has been at the forefront of delivering measures designed to give people the protection of the rule of law online, just as they have it offline. We cannot accept a situation in which social media is a place where cowards use the shield of anonymity to bully, harass and ruin lives. For too long, 
trolls, bots and bigots have flourished online behind a digital curtain of anonymity. Mr President, that's why we on this side of the chamber have been steadfastly committed to measures that keep Australians, particularly women and children, safe online. This government established the world first e-safety commissioner and the legislation to deal with abhorrent violent material online. This year we passed the Online Safety Act, which will take effect in January. And this act gives the e-safety commissioner new powers and digital platforms more responsibility, a new cyber, adult cyber abuse takedown scheme and a stronger cyberbullying scheme, reducing takedown periods from 48 hours down to 24 hours, giving the e-safety commissioner power to respond more quickly to the worst of the worst content, such as child sexual abuse material, no matter where it's hosted. And importantly, Mr. President, we've provided Australia's eSafety Commissioner the power to order tech companies to report on how they are responding to these harms, so that Australian parents know what these families, what these companies are doing to make their products safe for kids and families. If the platforms don't respond, they can expect hefty fines of over half a million dollars. Mr. President, since we came to government, the coalition has not stopped fighting to keep Australians safe online, whether it's the Online Safety Act, the recently announced anti-trolling bill. And these measures are all part of our plan to keep Australians safe online. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain how the government's strong stance on online safety will be bolstered through the proposed new anti-trolling laws? Minister. Thank you again, Mr President. The Morrison government is acting urgently to develop world-leading reforms to protect all Australians who maintain social media accounts. This legislation will protect social media users from liability when third parties post defamatory comments on their page and will also empower Australians to unmask anonymous originators of defamatory comments and, and content. Mr President, we want to give a voice and a pathway forward to the voiceless and protect the unfairly targeted like the young woman are suffering unwarranted attacks about her appearance or perceived sexuality, or the parents struggling to figure out how to stop the cyberbullying of their teenage daughter. These reforms will permit more Australians to seek redress for online harms, because anonymity should not be weaponised to abuse, to harass, bully or destroy people's reputations. The Morrison government is committed to keeping Australian women and indeed all Australians safe at all times in the real world and online. Well Senator Chandler, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline any other initiatives that will work towards protecting Australians online and how these build on the government's previous investments? Minister. Thank you again, Mr. President. Yes, Mr. President, in addition to the new powers that force global social media giants to unmask anonymous online trolls, the Morrison government has today announced a parliamentary committee to put big tech under the microscope. Australians are rightly concerned about whether big Order. tech is in fact doing enough to keep kids safe online. And as the Prime Minister said, big tech created these platforms. They have a responsibility to ensure that their users are safe. Big Tech has big questions to answer. But we want to hear from Australians, from real Australians, from teachers, from parents, from athletes, from small businesses and more about their experience and what it is that they want to see change. This inquiry will give Australians the opportunity to air concerns and give the opportunity for the tech companies to Order. deliver solutions. Mr President, the Morrison government is committed Senator to keeping Australians safe at all times in the real world and online. Minister, the time has expired. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to uh, the Finance Minister, um, Minister Birmingham, with the WHO declaring Omicron a COVID variant of concern, which could lead to further restrictions, has already led to border closures. Australia's live music and entertainment industries are again in chaos, concerned that they don't have the insurance to cover them in the upcoming seasons. They've issued an urgent call to your government and the Prime Minister to step in and fund a government insurance scheme for them. When will the Prime Minister do this? And why is the Prime Minister risking the small businesses 
and this economy simply because your refusal to act. The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson-Young uh, for her question. At, uh, at the outset, as I've said um, I think on every day so far this week, I do uh, urge um, caution in relation to uh, some of the commentary around uh, the Omicron variant uh, of COVID-19. Uh, that, uh, that whilst uh, there are still things that are not known about it yet, which is why some precautionary steps have been taken, uh, such as the two-week uh, deferral uh, of Australia's uh, reopening for movement of, uh, of students uh, um, and other particular visa category holders. Uh, it is the case that, uh, that um, many experts are highlighting uh, that, uh, that perhaps some of the concerns around this variant uh, are less than, uh, than perhaps were first thought in the initial couple of days after it became more publicly aware. Nonetheless, we take the matter seriously. We have also taken quite seriously support for the creative economy, Mr President. Uh, our creative economy COVID support package uh, was originally $250 million. Uh, we have since then increased it to over $475 million. That's in addition, that's in addition to some $730 million provided uh, to creative and performing arts subdivision uh, of industry through JobKeeper, uh, and about $119 million are provided in cash flow payments uh, to creative and performing arts organisations. And so, Mr. President, uh, altogether, uh, you can see that, uh, that the COVID support uh, has been well in excess of $1 billion through a range of different measures. Uh, that is uh, in addition uh, to the business as usual funding provided uh, to the arts sector at around $750 million uh, per annum that, uh, that the government provides, uh, along with other additional support. So, uh, Mr President, uh, I do not accept the characterisation from Senator Hanson Young in relation to an absence of support. Support has been significant, uh, it has been extensive, and it has been expanded throughout the course of the pandemic. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question uh, was specifically in relation to an insurance uh, support program, a guarantee for insurance. There is a market failure. Other countries have recognised this. The UK, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, Denmark, New Zealand have all put in place insurance schemes to fill this market gap. That is the role of government. Why won't you act? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, the $200 million RISE program, the Restart Investment to Sustain and Expand Fund, um, uh, indeed uh, delivers on some of the objectives that Senator Hanson Young is precisely asking about in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, supporting uh, programs uh, and initiatives to be able uh, to restart uh, that when events are postponed. Uh, due to COVID restrictions, we have been working with funding recipients uh, to assist them in relation to uh, the rescheduling. Uh, the funding is there uh, to provide, and to provide in a sense, uh, that support, that underwriting uh, to ensure that an event uh, can proceed, uh, even if there are uh, concerns and doubts that exist around that. Uh, now, it does not, and the Commonwealth Government's programs do not operate in isolation. Uh, they operate, of course, alongside uh, many state government uh, ventures, and, uh, and it is not unusual for many of these uh, major events in particular uh, to, in fact, be operated often by state government agencies and instrumentalities too. Senator Hanson Young, a second supplementary. Minister, last year the Prime Minister stood with Guy Sebastian and made a bunch of promises for the live music and entertainment industry. Very little of that has come to fruition. Now we see the industry on its knees begging you, begging you to act to stop them from going bust. Prime Minister, what would Guy Sebastian say? Minister. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not actually the Prime Minister, and nor am I actually Guy Sebastian. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm not particularly well placed to. Uh, to Necessarily address uh, those uh, those aspects in that form, Senator Hanson. Oh, um, sorry, no. Minister. <laughs> Senator Hanson, yeah, I'm on a point of order. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I'd just like to correct the record. I didn't mean to give Senator Birmingham a, 
a promotion he will never actually achieve. I take that back. Uh, so it's starting to, starting to look a lot like Christmas. Minister. It cuts deep, Senator Hanson Young, I heard. It really does. Anyway, anyway, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, we. Uh, I'm definitely not going to sing. That's uh, that's true, um, Mr. President. Um, look, these are serious issues, and it is why more than one billion dollars of additional COVID-19 assistance uh, has been provided to the creative industries uh, and the live performance industry being a key part of that. But in addition to all of those funding principles, the work in the national plan to help drive reopening is a key part of that and it is something that our government has led and encouraged the states and territories to follow to make sure these sectors can get back to business, which I know Minister, is what they want to do most. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts, Senator Hume. Glen Ira Council revealed that their future funding was threatened by Minister Fletcher when they questioned the benefit of two car park projects based in the Liberal seat of Goldstein. Mr Fletcher's letter states, and I quote, such a decision could well have the long-term consequence of reducing the chance of future applications for Commonwealth funding for the city of Glen Ira being successful. Why did the minister threaten the council? What a the minister representing the Minister for Communications, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Walsh for her question. I am not familiar with the correspondence to which she is referring, and perhaps she could table that correspondence so that we could all become familiar with that correspondence. What I can say is that the provision of commuter car parks under the Urban Gest Congestion Fund was an important commitment and part of the Australian government's budgeted $5 million, the part of the, uh, $5 million towards, uh, uh, sorry, ex more than $5 million towards, uh, towards busting congestion, reducing time, thank you, reducing time that people spend going to work, coming home from work and spending more time with their families. And we know that this is an important election commitment. It was not just an election commitment, it was a budgeted commitment. We know how important it was because it was very similar. It was a very similar program to that of the Labor Party. In fact, the Labor Party Park and Ride Fund was almost, almost identical. In fact, it was announced the day after it was announced by uh, then uh, opposition leader Bill Shorten, in fact, there were announcements of commuter car parks in places like Woi Woi. Woi Woi, the day after, the day after that the, uh, urban, the, 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 the fund was announced, that it was announced by Woi Woi, in fact, uh, by Deb O'Neill, Senator Deb O'Neill. Does that sound right to Senator oh. O'Neill? You announced a car Order. park. A car park. Order. That's extraordinary. Minister. Minister, 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 please resume your seat. Senator Wong on a point order of order. direct relevance. The question went to why the Mr Fletcher threatened the council. The minister says she's not aware. I have here the letter from Mr Fletcher in which the threat is made. I seek leave to table it so the minister could actually respond directly to the question. Is leave granted? Sorry, I'll just Seeking clarification is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator, uh, uh, sorry, Minister. I'll just rule on the point of order. I will. I will bring you back to the question. Um, uh, it was a reasonably specific question. I will uh, bring you back to the question, and you have the call for 35 seconds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank very much Senator Wong for um, obliging the opposite, for obliging the government with a copy of the letter. It would have been much handier if we had have had that at the beginning of the question, rather than in the middle. What I can Order. tell you, what I can tell Order. you, if you would like us to respond, Order. I would understand. Order. If you would like us to Order. respond to a piece of correspondence, it would be very handy if we actually had the correspondence in front of us Minute, while Senator we're asking Wong. the question. 
But that's all right. Senator you can do a little bit of political Senator Senator scoring. Senator O'Neill. What I can tell you is that in 2018, Glen Ira Council provided the member for Goldstein with a set of project proposals that included a commuter car park around, um, up upgrades in Bentley and in Elsterwick. Now, as is the prerogative of all members Minister, of the House. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. An independent report found that the proposed commuter car parks wouldn't remove cars from the road, but would actually increase congestion around the car parks. How many car parks will the Morrison-Joyce government fund for their own political purposes against the advice of their departments and the wishes Order. of state and local governments who actually deliver them? Minister. Uh, thank you very much again, Mr President. What I can say that, and what I was continuing to say is that the prerogative, as is the prerogative of all members of the House, the member for Goldstein advocated for his community and he successfully secured funding for those projects in Glen Ira. Now, on those projects, the Mayor of the Council said in August 2020 that substantial Order. federal government funding— Senator O'Neill. Substantial Senator, federal government Minister, funding— Minister, Minister, please resume your seat. There's no, Senator O'Neill, please withdraw. Oh, I didn't call her. I sorry, I may have misheard. Senator O'Neill, if you did not I say did not something use the words, disorderly, you don't want me to name again, but I did say about truth. Yes. Senate Minister, you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator O'Neill for her good manners. On the projects, the Mayor of the Council said in August 2020 that substantial federal government, and I'm quoting, and I know you love a good quote, Senator O'Neill, substantial federal government funding has allowed us Order. to bring forward these two. I'm sorry, Senator Wong, Order. I can't hear myself, let alone Senator Order. Wong. Order. Senator Wong. Um, Minister, you have the call. Thank you. Substantial federal government funding has allowed us—this is from the Council—to bring forward these two priority projects, meaning that Order. this is from the Council. This Minister, is from the Council. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Walsh, resume your seat. Senator Walsh, resume your seat. We will not recommence until there is silence in the chamber. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. Given the Council said the proposed car parks would create more congestion, can the Minister confirm this money was just another taxpayer-funded rort to get Mr Tim Wilson re-elected in Goldstein? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I suggest that, that can I suggest that Mr. Wilson has absolutely no problem beating whatever candidate you put up in Goldstein? What I can say. What I can say is that what we are seeing, Order. what we are seeing, is nothing more than a petty Order. partisan stunt by Labor and, dare I say, by Order. the Greens councillors in Glenara, who are determined to strip their own constituents of hard-won funding to generate a headline and score a cheap political point. I wonder who they learned that from. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank, thank you, Mr. Order. President. Uh, my question is to my fellow West Australian uh, Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds, and a question I think we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll all be united on in asking. Uh, can the Minister please advise the Senate why International Day of People with Disability is so important? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you also to Senator O'Sullivan for your commitment to people with disability right across our nation. Here in this place, we often focus on what divides us instead of those things that unite us and achieve Order. what Order. we could be proud of. Senator Thorpe, is this a point of order? <sighs> point of order. On. Point of order. Senator Thorpe, what is the point of order on? In the last eight hours, we've had Senator two Thorpe, Aboriginal women there is die no point in of order. custody. Senator Thorpe, resume your seat. There is no point of order. There is no point of order. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. 
Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Order. Order. Order in the chamber. Senator Reynolds, you have the call. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, and I think that was a great example of one of the things that can in inadvertently divide us in this chamber. But this Friday, the 3rd of December, is International uh, Day of People with Disability. And it's a great opportunity for us all in this chamber to focus on the things that unite us and the achievements that we can all be proud of. This day is about recognising people with disability and how we all support them to realise their aspirations and realise their full potential. The NDIS plays a critically important role in supporting 480,000 Australians to achieve their own life goals, just as we all aspire to do. And let me share with you one of the 480,000 individual stories of how the NDIS is changing lives. Mr Kupix from Victoria recently wrote to me and said that my support worker and the NDIS funding have provided me with the opportunities I never ever thought I would have again. The letter goes on saying how exercise, healthy eating and getting outside to enjoy the sunshine has been completely life-changing for him as it allows Mr Kupix to stay positive and also to continue to Order work. In the chamber. He also said that I can't be thankful enough for my government implementing the NDIS. On International Day of People with Disability, we unite across the political divide to acknowledge the contribution of people with disability and our bipartisan, in fact multi-partisan, support for their aspirations. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, how is the NDIS helping to deliver us on Australia's commitment to implementing the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of Persons with Disability? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you again for the question. Australians can also be incredibly proud that we were one of the first nations in 2007 to sign the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. We can also be very proud that we continue to lead the world in implementation. And again, the NDIS is a great example of this as a world-first scheme that promotes dignity and respect and puts participants at the heart of decision-making about their own lives and about what they aspire to achieve. Choice and control means that NDIS participants are more able to participate in our community and in society, both economically, personally, and also to live their lives independently. The Morrison government is committed to ensuring that the NDIS endures and continues to deliver for the 480,000 participants and also on their families whose lives have been changed by this scheme. Senator O'Sullivan, a second supplementary question. Mr. President, I thank the minister for that answer. Uh, how is the Liberal and National Government ensuring that all NDIS participants are provided opportunities to participate and achieve their goals? Minister. Uh, well, thank you very much again for that question. The NDIS has been transformative for hundreds of thousands of Australians with permanent and very significant disability. And it's also important to remember that it not only changes their lives, but it also changes the lives of their family and also for those who love and care for them. And being a world's first scheme, there were bound to be some teething issues with the scheme still being designed as it was rolled out to welcome hundreds of thousands of individuals into the scheme. But with eight years' experience behind us now, now is the time to again work together to mature and to evolve the scheme. Can I just say uh, I'd like to thank the states and territories and also in particular the disability representative organisations for their engagement on a wide range of issues and, um, and reforms to continue to improve the scheme. And I'll shortly be bringing forward a bill for the Senate to consider to further Minister, improve the participant experience. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice, and I seek leave to move a motion.